بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أما بعد We'll continue إن شاء الله تعالى our class the فقه الخلاف وأدب الاختلاف Jurisprudence and Ethics of Disagreement uh, Today إن شاء الله is going to be our the last session and we have done uh, you know almost the, uh, the main part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the topic uh, just as a summary, uh, you know, we had uh, finished the meaning and the nature of the ikhtilaf, the historical context of ikhtilaf and its development, uh, the reasons of differences, that's where we are now. And then just, uh, you know, uh, we already, the ethic of khilaf, we already, you know, we've been uh, studying it and talking about it and given comments along the, uh, what we were uh, doing in the first part, that inshallah, if you will have time, we'll give more. And uh, so the, f the fourth part, actually, we have introduced kind of the body of the other parts. And we will be talking about it. So the, the reason and the ethic in the same time. Because when we know the reason, it will help us to understand that the khilaf is based to, you know, or if, if it happened, it didn't happen to just be different from other people, but it happened because, you know, uh, the, uh, the circumstances, the incident, um, the, the way that uh, the perspective, uh, the nature even of the faqih, you know, uh, you know, the personality of the faqih, it might also have, uh, you know, a part of this uh, interpretation, uh, which lead to the ikhtilaf. So, uh, the differences uh, are not, as we have said, uh, meant to be different to dispute, but differences because, uh, you know, founded in the in sincere intention to seek the truth. So again, these differences are not, you know, uh, happened or meant to, to dispute other people. So if someone, uh, you know, uh, elaborate on, on one opinion, the other person will come up with different opinion just to dispute. That's, that is against the ethic of the ikhtilaf. However, uh, seeking, you know, uh, the truth, leading as differences, that's actually the ikhtilaf who leads to, to the rahmah, who leads to, to really have more than an opinion which help the uh, scholar or the student of knowledge to explore more uh, in their studies. And for the people, when they come to implement their deen, they will find, you know, different ways. All of them, uh, you know, founded in the Sharia uh, to, to help, you know, uh, have uh, implementing the Sharia and uh, go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with different perspective. So the different perspective are not different path, but uh, there are, you know, different perspective within the one path. Huh? Uh, can you please move this chair somehow? We'll forget to move it. So far, uh, we had... Uh, the book that I have mentioned will be uh, maybe the main book that you have the ethic of disagreement in Islam by Dr. Taha Jabir Al Alwani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. You can go uh, and we have it uh, uploaded, and mainly all what we have studied, uh, you know, the main part is, uh, is in that book. So you can refer to that book for your review and uh, your further study, inshallah. Uh, the last part that we have already uh, did, and all what you see, this is mainly is, uh, you know, uh, reported from the book that uh, you already have. Huh? Um, so differences due to the divergence in the hadith distribution and or authentication. Uh, the differences due to the understanding, interpretation of the text, and the differences due to the ishtihad done in the cases of the absence of the text. So, the reason of differences, you know, um, 
There is a beautiful book that also I will recommend you to study, uh, The Removal of Blame from the Great Imams by Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And this is actually when you say the removal of the blame, like you, no one has, I will say, you know, the right to blame the imams because of the difference of opinion that he had, you know, not, you know, or like uh, uh, he was different, uh, you know, uh, his opinion was different than the opinion of, uh, of the other imam. For example, you cannot uh, blame a Shafi'i to be different from Abu Hanifa or blame Abu Hanifa to be different from, from Malik or blame, you know, uh, Shafi'i to be different from uh, Al-Imam Ahmed. Why? Because they said, come understand further differences. So the differences that they had is a natural differences. It's a difference arise from the text itself. That's why, you know, this is the heart of the ethics and the heart of the adab. Because if someone, you see people who really, uh, at the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi describe it as one of the signs of, uh, you know, of, uh, of blindness of the heart, you know. When someone uh, insists on their opinion, or they are very pride with their opinion. So when people, they have an opinion, uh, you know, they want their opinion to prevail. That's a disease, that's a sickness. Even it might be their opinion is right. But the feeling to, to present their opinion make that feeling to be wrong. Huh? Why? Because they want to prevail. They want to be, you know, why? Because this person, even though he might have at that time the right opinion, if someone in another occasion present the true opinion, he will not accept it. Why? Because his intention or his, or, or his feeling or his, subhanAllah, uh, drive to, dis, to discuss, the drive to, uh, to argue is to win the argument, not to learn the truth. And I think uh, the uh, be most beautiful principle in the adab uh, of ikhtilaf is the saying of Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he said, uh, when I, I argue or discuss with a person or a scholar or learned person on a particular mas'ala, I always, I always wish that the truth comes from his mouth. And that's subhanAllah the modesty and how to be humble because we are seeking the truth. I'm not seeking, you know, you're not seeking to win. It's not, it's not a battle. It's not, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, fighting. It's not sparring. It's not... Uh, uh, is not competing to whom going to be better than the other. No, we are looking for the truth. We are trying to find the, 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 the path of the truth. So that book is, is good to study. I will, inshallah, will have some... Uh, we might uh, read uh, some part of it in the Lahi Ta'ala today. So let's go through the different ikhtilafat. So here uh, we said uh, some of the ikhtilafat comes back to, to the language itself, mm, to the language. So I will read here. Um, he's saying, now, one of the important things that the ikhtilaf that we are talking about is an ikhtilaf in the, uh, in the body of the fiqh, in the body of the jurisprudence. Okay? So the ikhtilaf that touch the creed, the fundamental of the deen, that is, uh, you know, that is devastating ikhtilaf. That's so wrong ikhtilaf. 
cannot have differences in the fundamental of the deen. Because if we have differences in the fundamental of the deen, then we have different sects, we have different deen, different religion. So the ikhtilaf first, the era to ikhtilaf, the realm of the difference, the realm of differences, is within the fiqh, within the jurisprudence. It does not touch the aqidah. It does not touch the creed, the fundamental of the Islam. For example, uh, you don't find ikhtilaf in the pillar of Islam. You don't find ikhtilaf in the attributes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't find ikhtilaf in the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you find the ikhtilaf, it comes, you know, in defining or describing his attributes. And that's actually, that's the part of the ikhtilaf who divide the people to be people Ahl Sunnah and the other like Shia and so on. And this is uh, Mu'tazila. So that type of ikhtilaf make uh, the path to be uh, off the path of the people of the Sunnah or off the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's not the ikhtilaf that we're talking about, okay? The ikhtilaf that we're talking about is the ikhtilaf into the field of fiqh, into the field of the fiqh. That's why actually the class is named jurisprudence, you know, of the, so the fiqh, how do you understand the khilaf? But the khilaf related to the laws of the sharia not khilaf related to the fundamental of aqid. For example, where will you classify the khilaf that someone will tell you, you know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he's the best of the Prophet, but he's not the last Prophet. Where do you classify, classify this one? Huh? This is aqid. This is actually disbelief. So this is, we said, this is not khilaf, this is changing the deen. This is changing the deen. So that's the, when we're talking about differences, we're not talking about a very specific field into the differences. That's why they called al-madhahib al the school of thought, the fiqhi school of thought, the jurisprudence school of thought, because they are, limited to the field of the fiqh. Wada is limited to the field of the fiqh. Tay. So the fiqh is يقول هنا معرفة الفقيه حكم الواقع من دليل من أدلة تفصيلية الجزئية التي نصبها الشارع للدلالة على أحكامه من آيات الكتاب. وحديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So when I say what is the fiqh? The fiqh is uh, to understand or to try to extract the law uh, of a particular ruling, you know, according to the way of the sharia. Now we're going to make it very uh, simple, inshallah ta'ala, so to benefit everyone. Uh, every action you do, Every action you do is going to be recorded in a book, right? So every action you do is recorded in a book. However, all your actions are not the same. There's an action you do them feeling and uh, believing that is an obligation. There is action you don't do because you believe it's haram. Action you do because you, you, feel, you, you believe that is recommended. So when someone is fresh and, uh, you know, uh, has like enthusiasm, he's going to do uh, double of what he usually does or she does. But when they are tired, they say this is recommended, inshallah, to, tomorrow when we feel good. But the salat they cannot because it's an obligation. So what makes them believe that that part is an obligation and what makes them when they act they feel is an obligation. I said, no, no, I have to pray first. If it's sunnah, I said, okay, I will do the sunnah later. So these different actions, right? So when I did the fard, 
in the Salat, for example, or for Asr, I believe that is an obligation. So I pray that believing that is an obligation. Taib, who told me that is an obligation? You enter, for example, to pray Asr. Before Asr, you pray to Raka. Then you pray the Asr. Then you came back to study. So how are we going to clarify? The first the f- uh, sunnah uh, you did, it's not an obligation. It's a sunnah. So it is recommended. Mustahab. So you seek the pleasure of Allah through praying. The When you pray the Asr, you said this is, is kind of uh, a debt. I have to pay. It's an obligation. If not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask you about me. But if you didn't pray the sunnah before it, Allah will not have ask you anything. You're going to find it in your record. You're going to find the plus. Huh? Then you came study. The study, it has a lot of bounties and everything. But everyone who's not studying, you're not going to tell them you're going to be punished because you weren't at the, at the class. Huh? So you will find that your action, you know, every action will do fall within one category. These categories are the fuqaha. They, you know, uh, fuqaha al-usul and the fuqaha, uh, the scholar of fiqh, uh, they classify, they divide it in five categories. The Hanafi, they have more details category. But the most general categories are the, from, from side to side, so you have the obligation, and the other side you have the hara. Then you have the mustahab, the recommended. Then the other side, you have the disliked. This is four. And the middle, you have the mubah, the lawful thing, permissible. So if you look at your day to day, you're going to find every action that you have done is going to be fitting in one of these categories. Say, I ate, say, mubah, for example, to not enter into details. I prayed. Uh, did this alhamdulillah you know someone invited me to do something I said it's haram so by being invited to do something haram and you don't do it because of the sake of Allah Allah reward you for it so all our actions you know fall in one of these categories so the fuqaha you can for example you know that you there is an issue that you uh, you know that you um, it's like an issue that arises to you. And you don't want to do anything. There's an action required to be done toward what you are facing as, as an incident, as an issue, as a matter. Okay? So you do not know how you're going to act. Because this is a new thing that you didn't know. So you want to be sure which of the categories this issue belongs to So your action is going to be based on a belief. Understand? So you say, for example, say, oh, I have this and this. Can I do it? You say, that's haram. So my belief in that issue, the new matter, it becomes haram. So I put on it a sticker, haram. So who told me that is haram? So I've been scared to do it. Why? Because if I do it, I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to blame me for it. Who going to tell me that is haram? Is the faqih. How did he know that is haram? Because he looked at the sources of the sharia and make the analysis or the evaluation of the issue. Find it, you know, there's things in the sharia that close to that new issue that is not existing in the book of Allah and the sunnah. And he say, this one, this issue is going to cause harm. This issue is going to do, if you do this, is going to do this. But according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not do this. And according to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, be away from this. Therefore, this matter is actually, if you do this, is haram. To turn away from it uh, and desist from doing it or desert it, that is the action of the halal. Then the verdict of the scholar, you know, give me a new belief toward that action that it becomes in my heart is haram. So you see how it's very sensitive, sensible, and uh, very, you know, vulnerable, and uh, let's say also dangerous, the, the, uh, uh, the action of the scholar or the work of the scholars. 
So then they have to be very meticulous. So they go to the uh, the adilla sharia, which are the evidence, the proof from the from the sharia, from the sources, which is the book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu the consensus of the uh, of the ummah. I mean, the, what we call al ijma'. And then comes the ishtihad, and the ishtihad is the effort that they put. So the differences comes mainly in al ishtihad. So the ishtihad is the mechanism of putting one effort to extract a law for a new matter that came up and to extract a law based on a methodology, based on a procedure. What is the procedure? It is to uh, look at the sources of the Sharia, which is mainly the book of Allah and the Sunnah, and to make their own weighing on own analysis. This is why we have different school of thought. This is why we have different school of thought. So again, what is a school of thought? What is a madhab? The madhab is an interpretation of how to implement the sunnah of the Prophet The madhab is an interpretation how to implement on how to implement the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Based on that, so the scholar who's putting his effort or her effort to extract the law, hmm, they're going to do it, uh, you know, based on the tools they have, based on the text that they have. Especially when we talk about the text here, we refer to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we have mentioned uh, last time, as the Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala said, uh, you know, uh, the sunnah, no one, in the meaning of what he said, no one has the whole sunnah, but the whole sunnah exists in the ummah. So no one had the whole ahadith of the Prophet. But the whole ahadith of the Prophet that he said that exists in the, because the amana of the ummah that they report all what they heard from their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So which is mean like the faqih, which is the scholar of fiqh, of jurisprudence, the jurist, he might make mistakes. He might, you know, by his analysis, you know, um, develop certain analysis, uh, you know, study it, and uh, uh, reach to the right opinion. He might actually get to an opinion that is not right. So here, if he get to an opinion that is not right, is he going to be blamed? No. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the one who makes the effort and reach to the right answer, to the right opinion, Allah will reward him twice. If he does not, Allah will reward him once, once because of his jihad. And this is here, the scholars go farther to explain to us and telling us, okay, then the person who did his jihad and he get the right answer, but he didn't have knowledge, you know, to begin with. Will this person has double reward? No, this person he's sinful. He's sinful. Why? Because he made an issue head and he get to the right opinion. He didn't get to the right opinion because of knowledge. He get it like randomly. So I say, why then he's sinful? He said, because he opened a door that he didn't have the right to unlock it. He said, why are you actually making it to hand? Why are you give an opinion when you don't have the quality and the caliber and the standard and the knowledge and the credential and the background to make it to hand? Father. So you find people, for example, they issue fatwa or they making decisions and so on. 
But they're making decision without studies. They're making decision without regarding many of the aspects of the mas'ala. You know. They're making decision from only one single point of view. They don't look, for example, at the need of the person who asking the question or at the need of a community. Uh, they think, you know, uh, it, it should like be like that. He said, okay, it should be, but don't you go to refer to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to understand the high intent of the sharia? Ah? You cannot, for example, the big problem, you know, actually we have it today as a very big problem, which is people, they already, they have the opinion and they justify their opinion by evidences. And these evidences is like, you know, they pull them, it's like they tear them apart in a way to just fit what they want to say. So the problem here, and there is some books like that actually. Uh, one time it was someone who told me this is a good book, you know, in the, in, in the library, in a bookstore. Of course, not here, it was in Arabic book. So I said, uh, uh, the, no, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, I read to this person, you know, just going through some of his study, but it's not. So he told me it's good. I said, you know, this person called to, uh, the word that I use, he said, Laysa Munsaf. Munsaf, someone is not fair and just. Because when someone has an opinion, he will bring you only the side of some narration to justify that opinion without telling you what other opinion are existing. So it's like someone is like one eyed. He only sees the part that it really goes with his hawa. You know. Say so like, look, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did this and did this and did this. To justify what he already, already talking about, which is like very, you know, uh, and these people, you know, like more secular than close to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they want to speak in the deen of Allah uh, with their perspective. For this is subhanAllah is not just, is not fair and it's not, uh, there is no that truthfulness in reporting. That's why the main uh, uh, quality required in the narrator of a hadith is the truthfulness. If he does not have the truthfulness and the sincerity, how can you take from that verse? So, So for someone who to bring an opinion, it required to fulfill two conditions. So the first condition, you know, between, between school of thought, that if you have difference of opinion, everyone who has an opinion, he has an, a sound, authentic evidence that he or she referred to. So we have a sound evidence. So if this person does not have delil, then he cannot even present the opinion. From the beginning, say the opinion is rejected because you don't have delil. So what is the delil? The delil is either ayah from the Quran, delil is uh, hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that need to be at least hasan when it comes to the ahkam al-shari'ya. Because the levels of the hadith, there is uh, the, the da'if, and there's the hasan, and there's the sahih. 
and there's categories between them. And then be, beneath the da'if, there's al-munkar wal matruku ila akhiri. So those who are rejected ahadith. The da'if, I mean the smallest percentage that we have that the Prophet Sallallahu said that the hasan, which is good, the sahih, is sound and authentic. And all of this grading of hadith, they uh, base on the chain of narration and the content of the text. The chain of narration for the sahih, it need to be like uh, the, the narration for a truthful, sincere, um, uh, on, you know, taken, narrated on one like him, and go in the chain back to the companion, uh, one of the companion of the Prophet the, the companion, you know, class or category are all, you know, saduq. Saduq, which is called like those are truthful, you know. So if you have the chain going back from truthful to truthful to truthful, and when we say truthful, it have the meaning of it in the terminology of the hadith. And then comes, add to it the memorization, comes at the way, the way how they narrated and how close to the... Um, uh, to the to the text or to the to the text, and how close if he differ from other who are b better than him or in the hadith and so on. So uh, al hasanu is the uh, minimum grade to be considered as an evidence in ruling of the Sharia, who should give you a belief that is a religion. Do you understand? Why? Because, uh, for example, say, you have to do this. He said, why should I have to do it? Because he said, that is an obligation. He said, how do you say that is obligation? He said, because, here, look, the hadith. Is this hadith sahih? He said, yes, it is. Then, based on the evidence he gave me, I'm building a belief toward this action that I have to do it. That's it. But then someone else, he said, why do you do this? He said, because this is, is he said, no, no, no. He said, but he, he showed me hadith. He said, no, that hadith is actually is not sahih. It's not true. This is da'if hadith. So, I mean, I might continue to do it, but not with the same belief as I had it when he told me hadith sahih. The hadith da'if, as the scholar, they like, especially in the... Uh, in some of the writing of Imam Ahmed, and especially in the details of being given by uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, that hadith da'if, you can use it. does not mean that you go going to reject the hadith da'if. But the hadith da'if, you cannot use it in an action that you obligate the person with it. You can, you can use it in thing to encourage, to inspire. For example, uh, you know, Qiyam uh, layl is something great. If you find hadith, they said, when you make Qiyamul Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you such reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower you with his blessing. So this hadith, it's da'if, but it's going to encourage you. Eh? It's going to give you like an incentive to wake up in the night and pray. So I said, yes, we can use that hadith because it's helping you to do something good. But it's not giving you a new belief to tell you, for example, all oh, this hadith, making Qiyam layl to be an obligation. He said, it's not an obligation, Qiyam layl And this is the differences between them. So this is the first condition. If you have an opinion, it need to be, you know, uh, based and founded on a sound, a sound uh, evidence, proof. The second condition, uh, it's like kind of uh, not clear condition, but which is mean the second condition, if you have an opinion in the other school of thought. That, that opinion, if you take that opinion in consideration, it might lead you to something wrong. So if the opinion leads to something wrong, should not even be regarded because sometimes you know there is opinion of madhahab who does not uh, refer to evidence but an opinion is like uh, for example someone asks you about you know 
uh, reading books. He said, oh, this is great to read books. So I said, what is your delil? What is your evidence? I mean, say someone, uh, you, you can bring the evidence about, you know, knowledge and everything, but there is things that we do a lot in, in, in our life. If someone asks you for advice, you advise him based on, on one's wisdom, based on some knowledge, based on the knowledge of the person, based on the thing that the person likes. So if you say, oh, you should do this, he said, give me your delil, you know. So, you know, this is, say, this is my opinion, my advice. Uh, that's why also in the madhab they have things like that. For example, uh, greeting each other during the Eid. He said, you know, uh, should we do it or not? We didn't have a text authentic from the Sunnah. Say they used to greet themselves. They say, Eid Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. Or people, they say, Juma Mubarak. He said, some of the scholars said, you know, استحسنهو. The, some of the scholars, they, they like it because it helps, you know, to people come close together and things and, and you kind of, uh, uh, you know, spreading that uh, word of joy and this and this. So this it does not have an evidence, but it goes with the ethic, it goes with the good akhlaq, it goes with the adab. So if the opinion from the madhab implementing it is going to lead to falsehood or to wrong, he said, this is actually... If you are insisting on this opinion, that's stubbornness. That's an opinion who's going to lead to division. That's an opinion who's really what he's called. It's not that uh, khilaf, uh, is like they call it, uh, this is the true khilaf, which is mean like we are disputing, we are fighting. And there is no a common ground that we are referring to. That's the problem. So the first thing, we said the delil. If you have an authentic delil, that's... If you do not have, then it's rejected. The second, if you have an opinion that it does not have delil, but is an opinion that is regarded in a madhab, in a school of thought, you cannot have that opinion to prevail others or to enforce it on others, especially if this opinion is leading to something falsehood. So it becomes stubbornness, and that's how it comes you know what we call a taqlid. A taqlid is just to imitate, a blind imitation of some opinion because some opinion that's been, uh, for example, uh, issued for a certain time in a certain, uh, you know, society uh, referring to certain circumstances. So people, they use that opinion, for example, today for the same almost situation. He said, your opinion is wrong. It cannot work. He said, no, so-and-so said it in the book, and they want to push it. It does not work. So he said, if this scholar then is wrong. He's not wrong. It was right, perfect, at the time when this scholar said it. But it does not fit the reality of today. Okay. So we, when we have these two things, this is how, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we can uh, have a common ground uh, to make out of the differences, you know, uh, a good outcome instead to be uh, division, dispute, and fight. Uh. And again, as we have said it many times, is about first the intention. It's about the intention. Because if, like we mentioned uh, last time, uh, the, uh, the argument that Al-Awza'i, I think, and Abi Hanifa, they had, and Al-Awza'i told them, I'm telling you this chain of narration, and you tell me this. So Abu Hanifa told them, I'm telling you this, because this one, yes, he's more knowledgeable in hadith, but this one is more uh, pious, and so on. Uh, in the end, everyone held, you know, uh, you know uh, every one of them, you know, uh, held on his own opinion does not mean that they fought and they become like enemy. So if we come, for example, to discuss, say, this is my opinion in this matter. So the other one, this is my opinion. If we are on the same ground looking for the truth, we have reference that always, you know, rooted in the ground of the Sharia, then 
there is no, you know, we should not divide. This is this is what I I feel believe doing it. I cannot accept what you're saying because it does not fit with my my perspective. And I see it like this is rooted in the Sharia, and he's saying the same the same for me. I said then these two opinion are right. This is right for you, not right for me. But is right for me, not right for you. But when we come to dispute. And the opinion that being given does not make sense. You know, it's either, for example, an opinion and how it does not make sense. I'll give you an example. You know, I don't want to get into fitness, but <laughs> but I'll give you an example in a general example. Always there is balance. You know, balance between excessiveness and shortcoming. Balance between, for example, courage and fear. Balance between uh, kindness and rigidity. There's always balance. Balance between rahma and uh, and uh, you know being harsh and and you know there's balance. So if you bring an opinion, when a person bring you, for example an evidence relating to the Rahma. He said, we have to deal this in mercy, these people, this, this. He said, hold on. You cannot bring the Rahma here. These people that you're talking to are fully violating the deen of Allah. So this is here excessiveness in using the Rahma. So you are using an evidence that does not fit with the reality, that does not fit with the reality at all. And vice versa is, for example, between fear and, uh, I will not say courage, but between fear and, and, and peace. Say someone, for example, uh, you know, nobody should uh, go out, for example, like the case that we had. He said, you know, are we not taking all the preventive measure, for example, as is being described by the people who are experts in the field? He said, yes, but uh, uh, these people that might not know, because if you go out, you know, this thing might be lingering in the air. Okay, how are you going to control this? So if this is excessive preventive precaution that it really is going to, uh, you know, cripple your life. So I say, okay, here, we're going to put a balance here. So it is the balance between relying on Allah and take all the preventive measure. Where are we going to put the balance? If I take off relying on Allah, then everything we're going to talk about, you know, be careful, prevent yourself, do this, do this, you have, do not do anything. You know, so it end up like everyone, like the whole family, everyone locked in his room. They don't even talk to each other. You know, uh, they talk by phone. You know, uh, I, I get you the food is by the door. Okay, can you leave so I can open the door? <laughs> so, where the ayah la yusibana illa ma katab Allahu lana, only befall on us what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala decree on us. So this ayah come to bring us to make the balance, right? Okay, we'll take all our preventive measure. You're going to clean your hand. You're going to do this. You're going to be away. You're going to be things. And according to what you hear, how spread it is. And this is, you know, it's very imminent that we're talking about it. Like we live this, you know, daily now. And it's part of our uh, daily life, a part of our, the trial that we're going through. So where are you going to put the balance? How can you, for example, you forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said there is no soul is going to die except by Allah's leave. And for every soul has his appointed term. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to say, leave the A on the side. He said, if you're running from death, death will going to walk to you at your bed when it comes your turn. So if you are hiding in your room away from things and it's your term of death, the angel of death, he said, no, you, you have to spare them because they took all the preventive measures and they are like... Uh, far from the thing. That's the balance. Because when people, for example, 
you say, you know, we're going to take. He said, no, there's people actually, they don't look that they have things. So how I say, someone come say, Assalamu Alaikum. He said, hold on, you know, you look healthy, but you might have it and which will appear in 14 days. Come back 14 days, I will tell you Assalamu Alaikum back. I mean, you understand one day, people, they say things, they say, come have it in the practice. Let's have it in practice. You know, so uh, when we're talking about this, we look the reality also outside because it becomes like an example for you, not an example, like an inspiration. When you see people going to work, people they go to the market is full like that. One of the brother told me he went like the store is full the whole day, and things. I said, no, you don't come here because uh, of that. I said, okay, so these people are all going to die except us, or all these people are ruining the whole community. So there is that, uh, that balance, I call it balance. What are you going to, to put the balance of fear or of how much preventive measure you have to do and how much you're going to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone not caring, you go and said, you say, I rely on Allah. I told them, actually your preventive measure is, is, is a pillar, is a condition in relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot throw yourself like someone, you know, uh, the shaitan want to test it, you know, want to trick one of the, uh, of, uh, an, a great eminent scholar. And, uh, you know, in, in certain story, we know that the shaitan comes, used to come in image. And maybe he's around us, you know, like in, in a picture of a human being, but we, we do not know because there's a lot of shayateen, so. Even the shaitan jinn, you don't know them anymore. May Allah preserve us and protect us, Ya Rabbi. So, uh, uh, and actually in the Surah Al-Anfal, the shaitan came and he was with the, with the kuffar. He told them, go and I am with you. And then when he saw the angel coming, he ran away. This is in Surah Al-Anfal. So he came to them in, in, the, in the image of a human, a human being, which was one actually of the tribes of, uh, of the Arab tribes. Now, <coughs> so the shaitan came in an image to, to a scholar. He told him, you know, if I throw myself from this mountain, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save me. So yeah, he's like, I trust in Allah and I'm going to throw myself from this mountain. I'm going to throw myself, myself trusting in Allah. So the scholar smiled and he told him, it's not us who test Allah, it's Allah who tests us. If you're wrong, you say, say the, no, that's you, you want to test Allah with your action. And that's already by thinking that you are violating even the way how you deal with Allah. It's Allah who, trust, who tests you, not you test Allah. So uh, this is here, subhanAllah, uh, uh, where, where to put the, the, that line where there's, subhanAllah, the balance, the mizan. So this mizan, sometimes it's difficult to find it when it's like saddle, you know, there's some details, uh, n uh, not uh, foggy, uh, you know, uh, issue. It has a lot of things that intervene that is different, difficult to find that balance. But sometimes, you know, the case that we're talking about, you know, um, you cannot base, uh, you know, all what you do on things that it really, you know, uh, you, you don't see it. It's not like, you know, something that's certain that is going to happen. If there's this percentage, so you make your balance based on this percentage. So they say, for example, the percentage, you should not do this. So you base on that and so on. So the scholar are the same, they're doing the same thing. When it comes, how to define that balance between the one side and the other side. And when someone is saying, okay, now I, you need to define what is the balance. The balance is the truth. The closest to the book of Allah is the closest to the, to the right balance. Now, 
some of the reason that we're going to go through, like, uh, uh, you know, its source, the differences, is the language itself, the language itself. So when you read a text, you might read the text and you will have a whole, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, picturing the whole scene that you read in the text might be totally different than the one next to you who read the same text, right? If, for example, someone writing, uh, reading something, uh, you know, kind of uh, a novel, for example, or the story. So in the story, someone is running and going up to mountains and they're coming down and everything. Uh, the description that the author, the writer, he's, he's putting, he'll give you like, you know, your, your conscience is putting all the scenery. And the scenery is going to be taken from your own background. Someone, for example, live in Africa, he's going to have a scenery of Africa. Someone living in like Europe, he's going to have the scenery. But he's reading the same book. So every book, the book give different, you know, perspective, different scenery, different feeling, if you can say, from, uh, from a reader to another. You know, kind of the, the general perspective we're talking about. So this is to make the close, which is this is more uh, real and more like, you know, uh, concrete when it comes to, to, this, uh, um, to these differences, what caused the differences. For example, he's saying here, قال, كأن يرد في كلام الشعر لفظ مشترك. There's الفاظ مشتركة. There's words that they are مشتركة, uh, which is mean like used in different you know, uh, ways is one word, but can you have different meaning? One word used for uh, different meanings. For example, kalafdati ayn, kalafdati ayn, the eye. Aynun is the eye. So al ayn is uh, used to express or to define the eye, is used to define the gold. Huh? So I say, Ayn, uh, I said, how much the Ayn, we're talking about gold. He said, I can see with my eyes, so we're talking about the eyes and so on. So one word, it has different meaning. So it is the use of that word, you know, who define the meaning of the statement, or, you know, or the sentence. So the meaning of the sentence, the general meaning of the sentence define the meaning of the word. Okay. So I said, you know, uh, uh, I got, you know, 500 gram from Ayn. So I say 500 gram is not going to be this eyes, it's going to be gold. You understand? So the sentence will give the meaning to the word used. He given us an example from the fiqh, which is the, the word al-qur'a. Al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah al-Baqarah concerning the divorcee one, قَالَ وَالْمُطَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءَ the waiting period for the divorce you want, divorce you want are three quru, three quru. Quru is the plural of qar, al qaru. Eh? So what is al qar? Qala hada raftun mushtarik. So this uh, word, it kind, you know, has two meaning. Al qar. So al qar has the meaning of purification, and qar has meaning of, of also menstruation. Qala bayn al tuhri wal hayy. So when you say three quru, uh, this color is going, the one who's going to take the purification, then the uh, waiting period start from the uh, pure part, you know. Uh, and then if you take it from the qara, which is al hayd then the waiting period start from, from the hayd part. And this is, it might, the difference goes to many days. Uh, many days is even, it depends on the, on the state of the of the person, so this is the differences. Is based on the word itself. 
and it has a lot of, uh, you know, I will not say differences, but it's going to lead to study different, you know, cases. And the cases is going to be depending on how the word was used. Is Qur'a Tahur or Qur'a Min Hay, Tahur or Hay, and so on. So just giving you some of the idea. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, what we call al-majazi wal-haqiqi. Al-majazi wal-haqiqi. Al-haqiqi is the uh, al-majazi is the figurative speech, kind of uh, uh, the metaphor, hmm? figurative or figurative speech. And the word uh, might be used, is either uh, used for the true meaning of the word or uh, used it in its figurative, you know, uh, you know, way. For example, uh, a lion, a said lion. In a sentence, when you say this person, he's, uh, he's a lion. So... He's not an animal that is a lion, right? So when you say so and so, uh, Zaydun, uh, Asadun, uh, you know, Zaid is a lion, which is mean. So it's like he's a strong person, a brave person. You're not, never you're gonna think in your mind that you're gonna see a true lion, right? However, the, the Al Asadu also is used for a lion. Lion itself, so when you're talking about lion, the lion as we know, as we do know. So, of course, there's other words. So the word that you see, you know, it is used as the word itself, what it means, or use it as a metaphor to express something else. Like, you know, he's a lion, which is mean he's a strong, right? So also this is leads to a lot of differences. Uh, for example, here uh, uh, al mizan. We were talking about al mizan. Al mizanu is the balance. So al mizan, when it's mentioned in the Quran. Al-Mizan when it's mentioned in Quran. So Al-Mizan, uh, if you take it, Mizan, we're talking about the weighing machine or so, the balance itself, okay? So if you take it from a haqiqa, haqiqa which is mean what the balance itself means. So it means that you're going to use it as a weighing to weigh things, right? So that's when I understand the mizan as a haqiqa, as a haqiqa, which is mean uh, uh, the meaning equal the words. Now, the meaning does not equal the words. The meaning has a metaphor. So this metaphor or a figure of speech for the mizan is justice. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and the heaven he lived them, and he put the mizan. So mizan, what are you gonna feel like? Oh, the heaven are lifted, and there is a big balance on top of, of our head. No, you say the mizan is this, subhanAllah, everything into balance. Everything. Work in very accurate, precise way. So you see here, the mizan itself, uh, in this area, uh, is is mentioned or used as al al adlu, and as also when Allah mentioned the mizan, the balance in the hereafter is going to be weigh the the amal, the deeds. Uh, for example, uh, other Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned, for example, in Surah Al-Hadid, we have ma uh, sent our messenger with, the, with evidence. Uh, uh, and we send down with them 
the book and the balance. So no one of the messenger has a balance with him that he's holding. So the balance here is the justice. Sometimes the majaz comes into, uh, you know, a configuration of a whole context. Uh, I'll give you this ayat, so it will be uh, good to see some of the ayat, uh, to study them, and to see what we mean here. And this is, we are studying then, just to remind you, uh, how the language itself, or the reading of the text lead to different interpretation, leads to different reasoning, leads to a different perspective. But not perspective that is gonna take you off. Always we are in the field of the fiqh, remember. Eh? The fundamental of the sharia, that does not change. So here, for example, in Surah Al-Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, let you read this to, to understand, you know, what of the majaz. Of course, I'm not going to enter into detail, details of those who defend the majaz and those who negate the majaz, but everyone has their, uh, mashallah, their evidences. But in the end, they come like the differences is more differences in the words in the alfaz than difference in Ad-Dalalat. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to the children of Adam, Talking to the children of Adam, look what he said. Ya bani Adam, O children of Adam, qad anzalna, we have sent down to you clothing that cover your shame and adornment. So this, uh, how this uh, ayah is, uh, you know, the configuration of the ayah, to put together something that you must understand this ayah in a metaphor way, not in reality. So, send down to you clothing. So, if you take it in haqiqah, uh, what do you mean? You take it as is, if like the meaning equal the words. So, send down to you clothes, which is mean, uh, uh, there, there were at that time rains of clothes. So Im imagine the rain in Minnesota with the, in the winter time. Huh? Clothes. People, everyone will be like fighting. Sizes and, uh, you know, style. <laughs> so what's the meaning of this? So the Tarkiba, how is being the ayah, to help you think. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only said, if you look at your clothes, you're going to be grateful to Allah. Because without Allah's favor to send the rain, to get the plantation, to get the cotton, and to give that uh, subhanallah, the mind for the people to think how to get the uh, cotton extracted to do the, subhanAllah, the wool and uh, manufacture it and turn it into, you know, material and then comes the person who gonna carry it and make it, you know, to fit the body of a person. So all that process is a gift from Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you back to the source of the gift that you have. You're not going to say this is made so or so or made so or so. No, that is from Allah. Even though it was made by so or so, because that mind and hand and skills that being gifted by Allah to that person to manufacture or to sew for you this clothes that you have. And then Allah points you to a greater purpose in the clothes that is going to cover your shame. Then the clothes is to keep you modest, not to make you someone arrogant. Yeah. So this all, as you have seen here, an example to understand it from its uh, deep perspective so you can, you can uh, give the right interpretation of the ayah. So this is, of course, is clear, but to see some of the example, how the words in the Quran have... Uh, 
deeper meaning and uh, then how it seems. So sometimes we have to uh, take in consideration in the interpretation who going to give us the ruling, not the word that you see, but what it implies. So that's why there is what we call Dalalat al Mafum, Dalalat al Nas, or Dalalat al Khitab. So that's what is can this way of uh, the sentence, the way it was formulated, is going to give me an instruction how to understand it. So you see, MashaAllah, our scholar, they went in depth to make all these differences. So someone who come to give an opinion without digging into uh, this, uh, this knowledge, that's where we said in the beginning he's a sinner, even he might reach to the right decision or right opinion. Also, uh, some uh, of the uh, show you this ayah in Surah Al Nur. This one? Surah Al Araf. Surah Al Araf. Surah Al Araf. Al Araf. Surah Al Nur. Now, if someone give you an order, so what does the order imply? The order usually imply an obligation. That's in the shadow. So, for example, someone, uh, you know, people at the office, the one responsible say to the worker, say, do this by Monday. Mm -hmm. Monday, the person didn't get back to the, to the responsible, to the boss to give him. He said, where's those things? He said, I didn't do them. Say, why? He said, you didn't ask. He said, no, I told you do it. He said, I thought that it's not urgent. He said, no, I told you do it. Right? Does this worker, guy, employee has any uh, evidence to show that he didn't know or he, no, because he said do it. For example, if someone said, uh, yeah, you know about that thing, he said, yes. Uh, if you, when you find time, uh, I need it. So after a month, did you do it? He said, no. He said, but I ask you. He said, you said, when you find time, I need it. So you left it to my decision to do it. So it was not an order. Right? So when you say, do this, stand. Someone say, stand, especially in the military, stand. They stand. If they don't stand, they're going to punish them, correct them, right? Say, stand, do, run, and so on. So what we call it, this is the imperative form, right? It's like you're ordering things, so you use the imperative form like ordering. If you read this, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, as an example, which is an example does not have uh, um, differences between the scholars. Wallahu a'lam. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, concerning at that time they have servant, and this servant, um, uh, it's like uh, the structure of the society before, you know, the, the servant, which is like mean, you know, they are, uh, under the property of the person who, who has them. So uh, Islam came uh, into this structure and uh, uh, it was not, and this is one of the uh, uh, great way of the Sharia, 
You cannot make a drastic measure or drastic decision to change the society because you break it and no one will follow it. So you have to introduce it till it becomes natural into the life of the people uh, and comes to, uh, to the result that Islam had it from the beginning. So Islam, to eradicate slavery, didn't come said slavery is haram because that's where the society, so Islam nothing have to do with slavery. But Islam come to, to put, even in that structure of the society, to introduce justice and equality within this structure of the society. So, for example, he said, if you go to the Prophet he said, serve your servant from the food you eat. You know, have him to wear what you wear. Uh, do not do this for them, do not do this for them, they are your brother, they are under your responsibility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call you accountable, and so on, so on, so So Islam came to, to bring the most important into the relationship, because that's what the structure of the society, so let's say the economy, you know, structure built like that. And it's known for, for you know, centuries, long, long history. Then Islam, you know, the next step is to dry out the sources of slavery. And then encouraging everyone who make a mistake in Sharia, I said, Allah wants to forgive you, free a servant. Even someone swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he, he broke his swear, he said, uh, Wallahi, I'm not uh, going to go with this, uh, to this, you know, gathering. And then he decided to go. He said, what should I do? He said, you have to expiate your, your breaking of the oath. What should I do? He said, you have to give free a, a servant. You know, one of the things. So there's people who come and say, look, I want to, to, to have my freedom. I want to be independent. Called them, okay, let's do a contract. You know, this contract... Uh, you know, for example, if you work five years, you know, the kind of a salary, based on that, you, uh, you, you get the salary and you pay me back till you get your independence. So here the ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look, he said, قَالَ وَالَّذِينَ يَبْتَغُونَ Those who seek uh, the writing from those whom possess, you possess. Amen, your right hand. So this is people who are under your, your possession. And they come to you, they want to writing. A contract, I want to be free. Then give them the writing. So here, it is recommended or an obligation. According to the way, so then give them. It's an order. However, this order... When you analyze it further, you don't find it imply obligation, it imply recommendation. Because you want to keep the structure balanced, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not force you to take away something that belongs to you. But He's going to talk to you the taqwa that's in your heart. If He comes to you, give them. So it's like, you know, uh, someone he said uh, you know oh so and so come to me and he want me to do this with him you know for example go ahead do it so I said do it that person will not understand that I'm ordering him I'm like encourage him do it with his leg to recommend him so how can we understand that it is recommending not 
obligation. That is the work of the faqih. And this how someone, for example, he looked at it, he said, it's an obligation. They have to do it. The other scholar said, no, it's not an obligation. They are recommended. Because in the Sharia, no one forces you to take away your possession. So if you do this for me here, then someone he said, oh, I like your house. You have to buy it for me. He said, why? He said, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. said, this fakati buhum. This is a contract. Sign. You see how when you take it in, in a comprehensive way, you'll find like there is a fragility. Then we said, oh, then his katibum is not an obligation. This is, this is a recommendation. It has more, more other perspective in brotherhood, in sisterhood, in, in helping this person. And actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, he put a condition. That's this condition is the qarina. Is the qarina which is comes that instruction to as a hint to tell you this is not an obligation this is a recommendation so in alimtum fihim khaira this is very good so the scholar what they said if someone came for example at that time talking about time who's been like they lived all their life like that so islam came to cleanse to bring justice to make the relationship to be based on piety and uh, grounded into the brotherhood and sisterhood. Someone is saying, you know, I won't do right thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you know, give them if you know that they are good. What is being good? Because there are some people, uh, you know, they lived all their life within a family, within that structure. If they give them the independence and they go on their own, they're going to be lost, lose themselves, and then they're going to be people who go to spread corruption to the society. So in Alim Tunfiyum Khaira, if you are pious and you know that these are pious too, and they're good, then do it. If you do it, then you're going to have another person into the society, you're going to spread more good. Because he's free and dependent, he's not under this one, for example, family. But if someone, for example, he's like, you know, uh, he does not listen, uh, lazy, uh, he's always being punished because he's like, you know, committing a lot of bad things. And uh, someone who's like, uh, he has an ill moral and he said, no, I want uh, writing. If this person said, I better keep you with me to contain your evil doing than to give you your freedom and your evil doing is going to be all around. And this is the balance. So therefore, fakati buhum here, fakati buhum, give them the writing is a recommendation by taking in consideration many elements to bring something good. So you're going to help a righteous person come out to the society to help in the betterment of the society. Not anyone who's going to come and he's going to uh, lead, uh, you know, cause corruption and so on. So this is in the language. This is, as we're saying, in the language. Qala qad yaridu al-amr uh, for example, was tashidu shahidaini, another ayah. So uh, uh, this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, um, just to give you ideas how the form, the imperative form, is used, but yet it's not. Uh, it's not an order. It is not. It does not imply obligation. By the way, uh, this is studied in depth in the, uh, the, uh, the class of Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh. Inshallah, if we'll have time, inshallah, we'll, in the next sessions, uh, we'll do it. And our next class, inshallah, today is our, our next class is named uh, uh, As-Sunan al-Ilahi, the divine law. And we truly need it because we have uh, many options to uh, to uh, uh, to choose from, 
and we chose this option because this class to be inshallah our next class and we'll announce to you one is going to be uh, most likely will be the week after uh, we'll see inshallah we'll, uh, we'll let you know uh, the divine law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the sunan ilahi which is help us really uh, to understand in depth uh, the, uh, the, the trials that we're going through you know uh, for example the situation that we're going through it is a punishment or it is a mercy You know, they're both. <laughs> you see, so the divine law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how it works. So everything, subhanAllah, works according to an accurate law that being uh, said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the divine law is very uh, important uh, subject, which is more close to the uh, to the creed, you know, to the to the big topic of the uh, al aqidah inshallah. We touch a little bit of the divine law in the second um, session of the seerah of al Nabawiyya. So we took the Medani period and we made it to be rotate through the divine law of success and prosperity. So the success and prosperity we saw, subhanAllah, is like Allah. If you do this, you're going to have this. If you're going to do this, you're going to have this. And so on, and so on, and so on. If you do a sin, you're going to have less light in your face, tightness into your sustenance. And the sustenance, not only the money, the sustenance what Allah give you rizq from blessing, from people being nice to you from uh, children be uh, obeying for the parents, from parents to children being rebelling against them, all of that, subhanAllah, rizq. All of chain of things happening because of a sin. And this is a law of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you understand the law of Allah, then someone, he knows or she knows what type of dua they have to make. For example, Someone um, uh, longing to, uh, I want of the class, huh? I'll give you an example, I think, to succeed in, in, in a test and being very anxious and worrying. The dua that they make in, oh Allah, help us succeed this test, but it's not helping them to concentrate. If you understand the, the, the law of Allah, your dua should not be succeeded. Test. Said, Ya Allah, give me patience to not be anxious for something that I have the ability to succeed. Because if you study well, you're going to succeed. It's not, it's not magic, right? So the problem, the obstacle, I'm creating the obstacle to be like field of anxiety, you know, I cannot even think of anything. So the dua is not, yeah, Allah help me to succeed. No, you have another problem. You, you created an obstacle, so ask the Allah. So when you think, this is subhanAllah, give you the right directive, the guidelines, when you know the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because... Allah will give you tawfiq to succeed, but if you didn't study, you're not going to succeed. Right? Someone didn't study, if you pray, you know, every night, qiyam al you're not going to succeed. Right? I mean, don't enter like that guy, I told you this many times for those who heard, from, heard it from me. You know, he entered in an exam and uh, they give him the, the copy of exam. He, he put Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he closed the exam and he gave it back. So the, the supervisor said, did you finish? He said, yes, I did. And he went to the closest masjid and entered praying to Raka. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, turn the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim the right, uh, right answer. Begging, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Sha'aru, you know, crying. And then when he got the exam, he failed. Of course he's going to fail. Do you understand? 
You cannot make such a dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a thing that you are responsible to do. He said, someone, you know, you told me, tawakkal ala Allah. He told him, yes, tawakkal ala Allah will bring you everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill what, uh, when you rely on him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be sufficient to, to your affair. So he brought the plate and he looked at the food. He said, I'm trusting in Allah. The food is not coming to me. He said, you know, he hold his hand. He says, stretch your hand and eat. That's the tawakkal ala Allah. Allah give you a hand. Why he give you the hand? To watch your hand and see the food flying to your mouth? The tawakkal is to eat. Because he said, I'm tawakkal ala Allah. And you like to just put your hand this way, cross your hand. You know, you're going to die starving and the food will never fly to your mouth. Okay. It's a glimpse of the Sunan Ilay, which is, you know, other subject, of course. Tayyip. Surah Al Baqarah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here said uh, when you take a loan from someone, write it down. And he said here, Qal, Wastashidu and call for evidence. Two witnesses. Are the witnesses a condition to have a, a, a loan, for example, to have a transaction? So someone, for example, come to you and said, you know, I need some money. So you say, okay, you know, but we have to have two witnesses. He said, why? He said, because it's an obligation. If not, the loan will not work. You know. No. So, as you see, he's like, is an order. But he's a stashidu. So, kind of uh, instruction to protect your rights. Because he said, what if you don't find, how did we know that just a, an instruction to protect? Because the ayah after it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and if you were traveling and you don't find someone to write it for you, you know, then, you know, he can give you something in exchange. He said, hold this, you know, this is my device. Uh, hold it, just give me the money. When I'll give you back the money, you give me this, for example. So you see, Islam make it flexible to help the transaction be fulfilled. But he will give you certain instruction to protect the rights for people to one day forget. He said, we have a witness here to, to remind you and so on. But it's not an obligation as a condition to fulfill the contract. Okay? So these is going to lead to differences of opinion. So as Kara said, he said, as she do, so I will not accept the contract unless it has two witnesses. Others said, you know, I see it as an instruction. It's not an obligation. It's two people that want to loan to each other. It is between them. You cannot stop, uh, you know, loaning uh, people or borrowing each other uh, money without having a contract and witnesses. Say, can a contract must be written? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you don't find, so the writing is just to preserve the rights. Yeah? So you see, in this ayat, uh, the order is there, but how to take it, it is recommended or an obligation. It depends on the, uh, on the, uh, on the whole context, on the whole context, and the ayat or the hadith that connected with it. Um, so these some of the example. So this ayat is to instruct. Other uh, examples, uh, they go back to riwayat al-sunan. You know, riwayat al-sunan um, is how do you uh, narrate the hadith? So I'll give some examples. So in the way to Sunan, uh, it has different uh, also um, 
categories or different uh, uh, you know element that really lead to difference of opinion And to this one, actually, it goes back. Most of the differences, you know, uh, are uh, a result of uh, the differences into the narration of the hadith. So I'll give you examples. Not example, but uh, some uh, circumstances, you know, that leads to differences. For I read here, and uh, what I'm going to read, you have it in the book. Huh? You have it in the book. قال فأحيانا لا يصل الحديث إلى مجتهد مجتهد ما. Sometimes the hadith does not reach one of the مجتهد, one of the scholar. He does not have the hadith. He didn't hear about that hadith. If he does not have a hadith that talk about the matter that he is trying to find a solution in it, he going to stop. Actually, he does not know that hadith exists. Does not know the person that the scholar, the mushahid, that hadith exists. فيفتي بمقتضى ظاهر آية أو حديث آخر. So his verdict is going to be uh, issued based on an ayah. An ayah that, you know, more have a general meaning, so he'll introduce this matter under the general meaning. Or another hadith. Another hadith not touching the, the, the topic, but it's close. So he make his effort and he, he give. أو بقياس على مسألة سبق فيها من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قضاء. Or just to make an analogy, قياس to measure on some of the you know issues that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had his saying and verdict in it. Also, there's أو بمقتضى استصحاب الحال السابقة أو بمقتضى أن الأصل البراء وعدم التكليف. So he's given us, he's the author, what are the different tools. So one of the tools, for example, uh, uh, These are qawa'id fiqhiyya. Qawa'id fiqhiyya, and I remember we have a whole class about al qawaid al fiqhiyya the rules or the principle of the fiqh. For the rules of the principle of the fiqh, he called al aslu fi shay al ibaha. Al aslu fi shay adam al taklif. So as the origin in things that you are not commissioned to do, you know, if for example say, uh, what about this? He said, everything that you see, it's yours. You can use it. So I say, what about this? He said, no, you cannot use it because it belongs to so-and-so. So what make me not use it? Uh, what about this? He said, you know, the land. He said, the land, if, for example, you're going to use it and to, to, to revive the land, then it's yours, for example. And it has a law here, actually, you know, when they were coming the first, you know, immigrant to the U.S. So uh, the hadith, so, for example, if they do not have text, say, you know, uh, you don't have anything to do. You can use it. Why? Because they don't have text. Because we refer that anything that does not have any restriction in it, then it's mubah, it's permissible. Huh? Like al aslu fil shay'i al ibaha, for example, is saying anything that on earth is permissible to take, to use, except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the specific text. He said, how do we know this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, it's who, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created to you everything on the earth. So this ayah make everything on the earth, you can use it. This is pure to you, you can use it. Allah created uh, for you. Then he said, do not eat this one, because it's harmful to you, and this one, and this one, and this one. Do not use this one, 
So it becomes that those restriction is to protect you. However, when I come to something, he said, what about this? He said, we don't have a text. Therefore, it's part what Allah created is yours. You can use it. So the, the ishtihad can be uh, done this way. And the scholar didn't know about hadith concerning that particular thing. So when someone else, he consulted another scholar who had the hadith, of course, they're going to be different. You see? So someone, he based his effort to give him the opinion based on an absence, but based also on the sharia. Uh, قال وقد يصل في الواقع موضع البحث إلى مجتهد آخر حديث فيفتي بمقتضى فتختلف فت... ف... آه... فتوى and another scholar who had the hadith then his fatwa is going to be totally different than the fatwa who does not have hadith it might be close but they're going to be differing and this is one of the reason of differences uh, Sometimes the scholar has the hadith, but he believes that there is a defect in the hadith. He believes that there is a defect, which is mean, he say the chain of narration has a weakness, therefore the hadith is not strong evidence to be used. Other scholar who has different study of the chain of narration or have the same hadith from different path, and he sees that the hadith is authentic. That's why you find many of the scholars, they said, oh, this is our opinion, is based, and so and so who said this, actually he based his on a hadith that is weak. So this is the difference. So they say, we are different than them because they're, so the other one, he said, actually, their hadith is weak and so on. So it depends on the study, so then uh, that's why there is a difference. Also, uh, you might have differences of the saying of the scholars because of their differences in uh, in the meaning of the hadith, in the meaning of the hadith, especially when it comes to transaction in meaning of what it means, al-muzabana, wal-muhabara, wal-muhalaqa. This is when it comes to, you know, transaction related to producers. You know, produce like, you know, I'll give you this as an advance and then I will pay you this. So uh, this, this name is uh, led to, to different understanding. Uh, different understanding then led to different, uh, uh, different opinion. Other uh, asbab, other asbab, تعود إلى القواعد الأصولية وضوابط الاستنباط. Now, the ahadith, we might, you know, give you more example, but this is just to uh, cover the main uh, categories that we have mentioned here. Uh, so, different due uh, in the hadith, that's what we have just touching to the understanding interpretation of the text. That's what we have talking about the words and the, how what imply the order as an obligation of things. Now, difference due to the issue done in the cases of the absence of the text, we'll, we'll give some example of that. Now, the difference that we're talking about here is asbab ta'udu il al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyya. So the understand to the qawaid, we can edit another category. Al qawaid al usuliyya wa dawabitu al istinbat, and this is really goes back to ilm, the knowledge of or the science of usul al fiqh, usul al fiqh, which are the principle uh, Islamic uh, jurisprudence principle. One if the meaning of usul fiqh. So these usul al fiqhi has, you know, uh, the principles uh, to which the scholar they refer to base their uh, their analysis and extraction of the law. 
And we have touched last week on the main principle of the Fuqaha. If you remember for the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali. Um, so, for example, those who advance, you know, uh, uh, some of the scholar, for example, he goes to that the verdict of a companion, if it's known and, uh, you know, uh, spread among uh, the, the, the scholars, and it does not have any other saying that it conflict with it, then for them is an evidence. Um, uh, why? Because they, they believe that this is, if he said it, then he must had, you know, learn it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so on or he bases his judgment on tools, you know, that they are uh, what the Prophet ﷺ learned from the Prophet ﷺ. Other, they don't see the evidence in the saying of the Sahabi, but only in what the Sahabi uh, narrated, uh, uh, has narrated or reported from the Prophet ﷺ. So here you're gonna have differences, of course. Uh, so these are uh, principles that they use. So, for example, someone will say, oh, you can do this because, for example, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said this. The other scholar said, uh, you know, uh, for me, if there's a hadith, I will take it, but I will not stop at the Sahabi because it might be the ishtihad of the Sahabi. So if I have something else, I will take it. وَبَعْضُ الْمُجْتَهِدِينَ يَأْخُذُ بِالْمَصَالِحِ الْمُرْسَلَةِ Al-Masalah. So Al-Masalah Al-Mursala is to uh, base uh, the fatwa on the principle of Al-Maslaha. Al-Maslaha it is to gain a benefit, an advantage, uh, to gain or to seek something that is uh, uh, beneficial. And seek something beneficial uh, that uh, goes with the high intent objective of the Sharia. So the Sharia, I want to make easy thing for you. And you ask him for a particular thing. There is no text. So I said, you know, go ahead and do it. He said, you know, the fatwa is being given based on the high intent objective because Allah wants to make it easy for you. Go ahead. So this is what we call it maslaha mursala. You know, is to have seeking a benefit uh, for the person through this fatwa and based on on objective or the objective of the shape. Taib, we'll, we'll stop here and we'll take the break, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but uh, uh, please, if you have any question, so uh, we can have some question and then we'll take the break and we'll meet you after. Uh, after Maghrib? After Maghrib. So the Maghrib is inshallah 7.23. We'll meet back at uh, 7.45. Huh? 7.45. Jazakumullah. Khair.